Hello, my name is Judy Matrani Reiser, and I'm an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. My colleague in India, Hari Kumar, and I will be speaking about the performance of healthcare facilities in Nepal after the April 25 earthquake and aftershocks of this year. I would like to acknowledge two additional team members that were in the field with us, collecting data and administering surveys. They are Tom Kirsch, an emergency medicine physician and the director of the Center for Refugee and Disaster Response at Johns Hopkins University, and Surya Shretta, who is a structural engineer and the deputy executive director of the National Society of Earthquake Technology, Nepal. As you can see from this slide, our presentation is one of many from our excellent EERI Learning from Earthquakes Reconnaissance team members. While our presentation has some overlaps with several others, it is most closely related to the studies led by Rachel Davidson on the performance of lifelines and by Chris Pollan on the resilience of communities. In our presentation, we will briefly discuss the overall human and physical infrastructure impacts of the health system. We will describe our data collection methods, including a survey tool developed by me and several colleagues at JHU and UMBC to assess hospital performance after a disaster or emergency. You will hear about the impacts of lifelines from Professor Davidson, so we will briefly touch on how utility damage directly impacted functions at the healthcare facilities. We will also summarize the non-structural and structural damage that our team directly observed and comment on how pre existing building conditions may have worsened building performance at these facilities. We will discuss also an important factor in the functionality of healthcare facilities, and that is the willingness of employees to report to work after the event. We will conclude by describing how impact to the transportation system affects supply chains that indirectly impact functions at these healthcare facilities. And we will conclude our talk by presenting a summary of our observations from the facilities we visited and future recommendations. The timing of the earthquake helped minimize the casualties of the disaster, but even so, nearly 9,000 people lost their lives and more than 22,000 were injured due to the earthquake. The Ministry of Health and Population report that of those that lost that were lost and injured, 18 and 75 were health workers, respectively. With these human impacts, there were high demands on the healthcare system. Again, the Ministry of Health and Population report that out of the 4,118 public and 350 private health facilities that they oversee, 462 were completely damaged, 765 were partially damaged, and the losses are expected to surpass 63 million US dollars. In order to assess how the earthquake directly impacted the functioning of healthcare facilities in Nepal, our team used a structured survey instrument designed by some of us as well as other researchers at Johns Hopkins University and at UMBC. The survey tool has previously been used in various reconnaissance efforts in Chile, New Zealand, Mexico, California, New Jersey, and New York. The survey takes about one to three hours to administer, depending on the extent of damage at the facilities, and captures health facility data such as bed count, size of catchment community, and annual discharges by service area. The survey also captures physical damage to the facility, including structural, non-structural, equipment, and utility damage. The impact to health functions at a single facility is completed by collecting data on supply chain disruptions, staff response, and patient evacuations, discharges, and transfers. The survey tool was designed to be administered by a multidisciplinary team, as the one we were fortunate to work with in Nepal. Our team included three engineers from the EERI NSET team, one physician aster expert from Johns Hopkins University, and two additional engineers from NSET and Ministry of Health and Population. These are a few photos of our team in the field in a wide variety of activities, meeting with government officials, different NGOs, learning from the experiences of hospital directors, and assessing damage firsthand. 
In our seven days in Nepal, our team visited five regional hospitals in the Kathmandu district, four of them public and one private facility. These hospitals include Beer, Teaching, Kante's Children, Parapakam Maternity, and Grande. These are all denoted in the slide with H's in the center. We also drove out to the Gorka district to assess healthcare impact closer to the epicenter of the main event. In the Gorka district, we visited one district hospital, one health post, and one primary health center. These are denoted with an H and two crosses. I will now turn the talk over to my colleague, Hari Kumar, who will describe most of the physical damage and success stories that we saw out in the field. Thank you, Judy. Hello, I'm Hari Kumar. I work with Geohazards International as the Regional Coordinator for South Asia. As Judy had mentioned, our team evaluated the performance of various levels of health facilities and the effects of the two earthquakes on their functions. We saw wide variations in the performance of the health facilities in these two earthquakes. Some very good examples such as the Srivan University Teaching Hospital with several, several layers of redundancy to and you know uh, compare that to some of the hospitals that were absolutely no preparedness levels. Um, the hospitals where uh, leaders reached out to people immediately. I mean, they, they called out when they evacuated patients out. Uh, some of the hospital leaders uh, reached out to people supplying tents for wedding functions, and, and they provided shelter immediately to everyone in their parking lot. And uh, to hospitals where they just waited for someone to provide tents to them for several days. So there was a wide variety of uh, preparedness levels we observed in Nepal. And utilities uh, are one of the critical uh, uh, items which uh, decide on whether a hospital can continue functioning or not function. Electricity, one of the main utilities functions. The power outage had been limited to between 4 to 15 hours of the earthquake. And most of the hospitals in Kathmandu and beyond are used to such kind of outages. Uh, they normally have power cuts and they have functioning generators. The earthquake does not seem to have damaged electrical equipment uh, in uh, hospitals, even though most of them had not been anchored. You have um, generators and other electrical equipment just uh, sitting there, even though there have spaces for these to be anchored, they are uh, almost never anchored. For these generators, most of the hospitals did not have adequate fuel supplies to run them for long. But luckily, the roads leading to the nearest fuel stations were open and supplies would be replenished before they ran out. None of the hospitals we visited had the 72-hour backup, which is uh, what is recommended by WHO. Even in hospitals where they had large fuel tanks that could store up to 6,000 liters of diesel, uh, we found that most of these uh, were empty. Water uh, is the next critical utility and uh, none of the hospitals uh, we visited uh, dependent on the local water distribution system for water. But again, we observed wide variations in the preparedness levels in these hospitals. Some very important hospitals had only a single source of water supply. Uh, for example, in the Beer Hospital, we saw that they had a new source of water supply which had been, which is outside the hospital campus across the road and because it is across the road it was not connected to the generator backup supply. So once the, the power supply from the external grid failed, this water source also became useless. But many of the, these hospitals had to rely on water tankers uh, uh, from uh, outside. And again, because the roads were open, the water supply tankers could come and replenish the water supply for these hospitals. Their storage was mostly in water tanks, either on the roof or uh, at, the, at the ground level. In some cases, the hospitals had these tanks, uh, which are unanchored, and, and some of the connections to these tanks failed because the, the tanks uh, slid. But in some of the hospitals, like the teaching hospital and the Kanti hospital, uh, which were essentially built by the, by the Japanese for uh, the government of Nepal, 
the tanks uh, had been anchored, even the large uh, tanks uh, had been anchored. And the teaching hospital was an ex example of extreme preparedness. They had a, a separate source, which you can see on the, on, on the left, a separate third source kept ready for emergencies with a generator supply. You can see in the background of the same picture, a dedicated generator supply. And in, in this, all along this uh, connection and in this uh, emergency water supply, they had flexible connections. And you can see on, on the picture on the right, these flexible connections uh, appeared to have been tested by the earthquake. And if the connection had been rigid, it would have, the pipe would have broken and uh, the water supply system would have failed. In anticipation of this kind of pipeline damage, the ho hospital had also a fire hose reel kind of connections kept ready with plants in place and people trained to be able to supply water to all critical functions of the hospital, all critical buildings of the hospital. The plan of, of such, the emergency plan for uh, the layout of the water supply is seen in this picture. As far as medical gases are concerned, most hospitals in Nepal do not have any dedicated medical gas plants and they are all dependent on external suppliers. Many of them don't have adequate storage or dedicated storage spaces and cylinders are, are stored all around the hospital, mostly in corridors. And uh, the falling cylinders in, in these corridors disrupted the evacuation of many hospitals and the noise of these cylinders falling down traumatized patients and bystanders, especially in the Kanti Children's Hospital. When the hospitals ran out of uh, oxygen supply, they contacted the suppliers to supply because the suppliers did not have any staff members to supply oxygen and they, uh, the hospitals had to send out vehicles and ambulances to collect oxygen cylinders to replenish their supply. On the left, the uh, Teaching hospital again, the oxygen storage is, is shown very clearly where the cylinders have been restrained. But however, uh, as you can see on the picture on the right, many hospitals, the oxygen cylinders connected to the manifold were not restrained, even though there were hooks and chains available with the staff members, uh, unfortunately, forget to, to use these restraints. In hospitals where the pipe medical gas supply was provided, the gas lines going from one building to another did, work, did not have any kind of flexible connections. So when buildings uh, were shaken around, uh, many gas lines broke. And even when the medical gas lines passed through uh, walls, they were not provided with any sleeves. So uh, the pipelines broke in several places. And in this picture, which is uh, not very common, the wall uh, have suffered damage, but the pipe remained where it was. Non-structural damage was common. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, infill wall damage. Uh, the extreme case is shown in this picture. But such kind of damage was not common in, in all hospitals. But this was an extreme case in, in, in the Parokka maternity uh, hospital. In many hospitals, of course, the oxygen cylinders, which have been talked about before, uh, fell down. Equipment uh, suffered uh, damages, especially uh, uh, x-ray uh, machines and uh, um, surgical lamps fell down uh, in, in several hospitals. There were, again, good examples, like in the teaching hospital, they had taken precautions and anchored shelves, cupboards, and equipment which prevented uh, a lot of losses in the hospitals and helped the hospital come back, start functioning quicker than it was possible in the other hospitals. As of now, the non-structural risk reduction is not covered under any building code, not only in Nepal, but in several countries in the region. And I think this will be very, very important uh, element to be included in the, in the building codes from now on. Structural damages are concerned, very few hospitals collapsed. But it was uh, very interesting to note that even in hospitals which suffered minimum damage, every patient, everyone in the hospital is evacuated. Uh, this uh, 
uh, shows uh, people were not sure about their, their buildings. And every patient, uh, even patients in, who had just completed their surgeries, uh, were brought out uh, into the parking lots. Uh, poorly built uh, concrete and unreinforced masonry buildings did not fare well. And uh, almost in every hospital, uh, there doesn't seem to be a master plan. Uh, a building is constructed, then there are several additions and extensions to these buildings, and many of these did not fare well. This is uh, uh, the building in, in Paraparokkar Maternity Hospital, the RC frame structure uh, built before the building codes were enforced did not fare well, as can be seen in the next pictures. Severe damage, and uh, everyone had to be evacuated immediately uh, following the earthquake. This is uh, the building layout from the Burka uh, District Hospital. As you can see on the left, the block G started off as a, as a rectangular building, but years of additions of rooms and, and uh, wings have made the building far more vulnerable than it was uh, in, in the beginning and had to be retracted. It's a single story uh, building, but suffered damages at several parts and had to be retracted. Uh, similarly, Block D was also uh, open only in portions um, because of the damages it suffered on, on the extensions part. Compare that to Block B, which is a simple uh, rectangular building, the emergency block functioned really well. Uh, uh, the doctors said that they, even though they had evacuated immediately, they started functioning within the, uh, the building immediately. And uh, this is a view of the building. And even the non-structural hazards uh, within the building, which was uh, all secured, functioned really well. So simple plans worked well. Complex additions, extensions did not work well. One uh, lesson coming out of uh, all of these discussions on hospitals and hospital buildings is that there seems that there needs to be a separate building code for hospitals. Uh, hospitals are now are built as any other uh, buildings are built, uh, designed and built in Nepal. And this is the same uh, in, across uh, the region. And uh, I think uh, this earthquake and the, uh, the effects on hospitals and their functionality uh, really reminds us that uh, we need to be considering hospitals as very special buildings which need special design and construction abilities. And even in, in good buildings such as this, uh, maintenance becomes an issue. But even the buildings which work well uh, require maintenance. And uh, you can see in this uh, shows a water tank which leaks, uh, according to the hospital staff, leaks every day and there's hardly any maintenance and which has caused the dampness to seep into the hospital building vault uh, within, within the emergency ward. And this is the case with several buildings across the hospitals we visited that maintenance is lacking. And this is probably uh, due to the due to the fact that not enough attention is paid to the maintenance department, uh, the staff, uh, nor do they have enough funds. Thank you. As Hari just showed in the previous slide, even well-designed and constructed buildings sometimes had areas with poor maintenance. We saw widespread deterioration of structures because of lack of upkeep. Many of the facilities we visited had unaddressed water damage, creating possible occupational safety hazards and also deteriorating conditions of the building's envelope. Maintenance departments are as important as any other department in the hospital and thus need larger budgets, adequate staff, and proper training programs. Here's an example of a hospital facility with poor upkeep. We saw several examples like this of water damage that had begun growing mold and even plants on exteriors and interiors of structures. Another common issue we saw in many facilities was a lack of fire suppression systems. Of the many structures we visited across the eight healthcare complexes, 
we only saw two buildings equipped with fire sprinklers. The majority had none or minimal firefighting systems. For example, in the picture on the right hand side, we see a single fire extinguisher on the floor of the corner of the boiler room in a building. This was the only fire extinguisher we had seen in the entire structure. In addition to the adoption of fire suppression systems and outfitted facilities with more fire extinguishers, we think it is important that the staff be adequately trained in using such equipment. In order for healthcare facilities to remain functional, it is necessary that their human infrastructure is healthy and responds, in addition to having an adequate space to provide services. Many of Nepal's healthcare facilities have on site housing for staff. Having healthcare workers in close proximity ensured that staff reported to work in higher than normal numbers. A few facilities had done extensive emergency preparedness training with their staff, but the majority had none or limited training before the earthquake. Given this reality, the staff reported as best they could, sometimes even transporting patients, medical equipment, and supplies in their personal cars. In addition to the level of training playing a role in the response of workers, the leadership of hospital directors played a major role. Many workers, including those that lived on hospital complexes, sadly lost their homes in the earthquake. There was a lot of ad hoc coordination between tending to home duties and work duties. The large aftershock of May 12th severely impacted the confidence of the staff to continue operating indoors and many evacuated patients that had started to move back indoors when the large aftershock hit drove patients and workers again outdoors. Based on the interviews in the field, there's still a significant need for psychosocial care of staff due to the trauma caused by the earthquake and aftershocks. In addition, it would be beneficial for all healthcare facilities to adopt consistent staff training, planning, and tabletop top exercises as those administered by NSET. Here's an example of badly damaged staff quarters. Nurses working in the tents on the right-hand side had been living in the staff quarters that are significantly damaged on the left-hand side. Some of them felt that these constant reminders of lost lives were affecting them psychologically. Some hospitals ran out of specific supplies, but in general, there were not critical supplies issues. This mostly had to do with the fact that patient numbers were not overwhelming and due to the large migration of people out of the Kathmandu Valley. Supplies in Kathmandu hospitals were restocked by the Ministry of Health and Population, and most hospitals rejected offers of medicines and doctors, but in remote areas, NGOs did provide supplies and care. There is a need in Nepal for consistent plans of stockpiling supplies. Here's a figure from a document published by the Geohazards International on reducing earthquake risk in hospitals from equipment, contents, architectural elements, and building utility systems. You can see in this figure that in order to keep hospitals functional, it is necessary that buildings are safe, that communication and utility systems remain functional, that medical equipment work, and that supplies are made available. These systems' functionality directly affect the hospital, but they also impact each other's functions, as you can see with the flow of arrows. In addition to these direct impacts to facilities, it is also necessary that municipal utility supplies regain functionality quickly, as well as access to healthcare facilities to ensure that patients can safely access healthcare delivery. We will conclude this presentation with a few final thoughts from our experiences in the field. The healthcare system is a patchwork of building code implementation and building performance because of significant foreign assistance in this sector. There are many countries who have invested and constructed healthcare facilities in Nepal based on their own country's standards. Therefore, we saw a wide range of mitigation and performance of structures. In fact, some facilities are models for the U.S. and the rest of the world. After the main event, all facilities evacuated completely, regardless of damage level, and this even included many patients in the ICUs.
Many health facilities managed to function in alternate spaces after the earthquake, offering less than optimal care. Most of the facilities were operating in tents, outdoors, supplied by other countries, NGOs, and even local party suppliers. The facilities were visited, that we visited had implemented a wide range of disaster preparedness plans. Some ex were extremely prepared, while others were not at all. External utilities failed or were severely disrupted, but backup facilities were mostly functional. Again, due to outages on a daily basis before the event, backup systems were continuously tested. Many hospitals reported less than normal patient intake, and there was a significant outmigration from Kathmandu after the earthquake. There were very few examples of equipment being braced across facilities that we visited. Specifically, unbraced medical gas cylinders fell, creating loud crashing sounds and scaring many occupants. In general, buildings with poor construction quality and those that had been added on to over the years did not fare well. Again, poor building maintenance contributed to the overall damaged state of structures. There was widespread data infill walls, often concerning occupants about the safety of healthcare buildings. And finally, staffing numbers were normal or above normal due to on-site staff residences and some preparedness trainings. Our immediate recommendations based on our observations from the field are that the Net Nepal adopts building standards for critical buildings and that these standards consider the performance of non-structural elements. Also, firefighting systems need to be installed in all healthcare facilities to minimize daily fire hazards as well as fire after earthquake incidents. Backup for utilities need to be robust. There needs to also be consistent staff preparedness and planning activities. And this event provides an opportunity to reflect on and to strengthen preparedness plans based on recent experiences. Tabletop exercises would greatly benefit healthcare staff. And finally, we recommend a national action plan for the safety of healthcare facilities in Nepal. Here are some references that we cited throughout our presentation and that might be helpful for further reading on maintaining hospital functions after earthquakes. Additionally, there is a wealth of data from the Nepal earthquake available on EERI's virtual clearinghouse. We would also like to especially thank our virtual team collaborators, Lisa Crane, Tracy Becker, and Kiara McKinney, who helped track down information while we were in the field. They uploaded photos when we returned and assisted with this presentation. Thank you very much. This work would not be possible without the support of EERI's Learning from Earthquake program, the local support of NSET staff and engineers, and also fellow team members for insightful conversations and input on the ground. In addition, our team was fortunate to work closely in the field with Sunil Kadka, the Infrastructure Planning Advisor at the Ministry of Health and Population, and Hima Shreta, the Director of Earthquake Engineering and Training at NSET. We toured facilities together and they were an integral part of our team and our studies. We would also like to thank the directors, facilities managers, and staff at the hospitals, as well as, as the Ministry of Health and Population, who shared their time and experiences with us. We would like to end with a photo from a facility who had prepared so well that even their flower pots were properly restrained. Thank you very much.